Hello everyone, my name is Lawrence Haddad. I'm one of the co-chairs of the group that puts the Global Nutrition Report together. The report is the only global scorecard on malnutrition in all its forms. It focuses on outcomes uh, as well as actions and data gaps. This is the 2015 report uh, that's just come out and I wanted to uh, take this opportunity to walk you through some of the main findings, conclusions and recommendations. Here's the outline. I'm going to walk you through nutrition as a driver of sustainable development. Um, we're going to talk about progress on nutrition outcomes, uh, on nutrition actions. Uh, we'll talk about financing and capacity, how much needs to be spent to get us to our goals. We'll talk about potential allies in the climate, food systems and business areas, allies that can help us accelerate progress on malnutrition reduction. We will talk about accountability and data. Uh, that is the bread and butter of the report, which is essentially an accountability report. And then finally, we walk through some of the calls to action, which we hope are specific and measurable. First, nutrition as a driver of sustainable development goals. Now, why might we invest in improving nutrition? There are lots of different reasons and lots of different audiences um, require lots of different arguments. The first argument we can make is that uh, food is a human right, um, the rights of children to adequate uh, lives and, and healthy lives. Um, that's a very fundamental um, a right and it's, it's something that children particularly have a very difficult time claiming from, from duty bearers. The second argument is around health and survival. Um, we know that 45% of all uh, deaths under the age of three are in one way or another linked to malnutrition. So if we want to reduce uh, child mortality, we need to improve nutrition status. But it's also about the health of the child, not just whether the child survives, but whether it thrives. And we know that uh, children that have better nutrition status have a lower burden of disease and are, are much more likely to, to be happy and, and well. It's also about intergenerational equity. What are we doing in this generation to uh, facilitate and empower and, and help the next generation uh, again, thrive uh, and develop. And then finally, uh, the economic benefits. The ministers of finance who think in terms of uh, cold, hard uh, economic returns, there are some very significant uh, returns and significant uh, investment benefits for, for them of investing in nutrition, especially very early on in life. And, and here are some of the economic returns. This is some of the, the results from the last year. Um, in the literature on the economic benefits of improving uh, nutrition status. So in the 2014 report, we reported on the benefit cost ratio being 16 to 1 for investing in scaling up nutrition interventions. For every one peso, one rupee, one burr, one dollar, you get 16 back over the course of a lifetime. That's a fantastic investment. It outperforms the US stock market over the last 70 years. It's, it's an amazing investment. But the question was, is it just a, is it just the result of one study, um, one set of assumptions? Well, we have now new studies from Brazil, Malawi, and four countries in sub-Saharan Africa that very reassuringly um, give us the same conclusion as the, as the study, the 16 to 1 study did. Um, it shows that the economic returns are roughly in the same ballpark, um, roughly 10% uh, rate of compound interest on an, on an investment in improving nutrition, which is a fantastic investment. And um, if you're a Minister of Finance, you should be in, as interested, if not more interested, in investing in human infrastructure as you are in ports and roads, the hard infrastructure that we hear so much about. Despite these reasons for investing in nutrition, the, the rights-based reasons, the health and survival-based reasons, the intergenerational equity reasons, and the economic reasons, the sustainable development goals are still pretty silent on nutrition. Yes, uh, nutrition is mentioned in Sustainable Development Goal 2, which is fantastic. That's a big improvement over the Millennium Development Goals. But only one, hundred, only one out of 169 SDG targets actually even mentions nutrition. None of the implementation targets in the SDGs mention nutrition. Obesity is not mentioned once in the SDGs. And if you do a word cloud analysis of the draft SDG outcome, you find all the usual words in there, poverty, climate, 
hunger, economics, um, gender, women, education, health, but you don't find nutrition. And I, I think it's a real shame that nutrition barely registers in the SDGs below the headline number. And we as a community, as a nutrition community, have until the end of 2015 to get more indicators into the SDG indicator set. The goals and the targets might be set, but the indicators are not quite set yet. So if any of you uh, have any influence with that process, it's uh, a subcommittee in, the, in UNDP that's, that's managing it. Um, the report tells you exactly where to go and how to influence that group. Please do, because what, what gets measured gets managed, and what gets measured gets financed. Next, we talk about progress on nutrition status. How well are we doing in reducing malnutrition? So we focus first on stunting reduction. This is under fives. And actually, we're doing pretty well here. In, in 2014, only 24 countries were on course to meet the global World Health Assembly targets. In 2015, we're up to 39 countries. Now, that's great. Uh, is that because all these countries are suddenly doing so much better in the last year? No, it's because a whole bunch of new data have come in in the last year, in this, in this final MDG year, and have actually shown us that the picture we presented last year was uh, woefully out of date. 39 countries are actually on course to meet the SDG global target, which is fantastic. And it just shows you the importance of having up-to-date data. Um, An and, and additional 60 countries are are making some progress, even though they're not as making as fast a progress as we would like from the global for the global targets. And only 15 countries are not making any progress whatsoever. So I think that's quite a positive, positive story. On wasting, these are kids who are um, too, too thin for their height. Um, they are, um, here, we're, here we're also seeing an improvement. Um, in 2014, we had um, fewer countries on course than off course. And now in 2015, we have more countries on course than off course. Still a lot of countries off course, but um, the number on course is increasing and that's good news. Similarly, on under five overweight reduction, um, we have 39 countries that are on course and making good progress, up from 31 in 2014. And we have about 46 countries that are off course uh, on, this, on this target. Um, some of those countries, 22 of them are making some progress and 24 are not making any. Exclusive breastfeeding rates are evaluated for the first time in the Global Nutrition Report. We, for the first time, we have data only for 78 countries, but uh, that's better than nothing. And for these 78 countries, we can assess whether they are on course to meet the global targets or not. And 32 of them are, uh, but 46 of them are not. And in fact, in six countries, we've got some serious reversals, uh, countries where the exclusive breastfeeding rate has actually declined by more than 10% uh, between, the, between the two last data points. And exclusive breastfeeding rates for the first six months of life are absolutely vital to ensure the child gets off to the best possible start in its nutrition journey. And those rates simply have to be above 50% at the very minimum. So in terms of undernutrition, it's a mixed picture. There's some good news, there's some not very good news. Um, but in terms of overweight, obesity, and diabetes, the picture is very bleak. In fact, when you look at the number of countries that have reduced adult obesity rates, the number is zero. We couldn't find any countries that have reduced adult obesity rates. And re reducing these rates is one of the World Health Assembly goals. So a, a wrap up of all the outcomes is provided in this rather complicated slide, but each row is, a, is an indicator and each number is a number of countries uh, in, in a particular category. So the green denotes countries that are, um, have met or on course to meet the global target. Uh, the orange means countries that are off course but making some progress, and the red, of course, means off course and little or no progress. So we want to see more green and much less red and orange. We also want to see uh, less grey. Grey means that we have missing data and we can't actually even assess for these countries uh, whether progress is being made. And you can see 
This picture is particularly bleak for exclusive breastfeeding rates where we can't make the assessment for 115 countries. Now, we also, um, we don't just monitor nutrition status in this report, we monitor progress on nutrition actions because this is really an accountability report. So we start out with the Nutrition for Growth uh, commitments. These are commitments made in 2013 in London by a wide range of signatories to the Nutrition for Growth Compact. We assess how many of these are smart, that is specific, measurable, assignable, realistic and time bound. Uh, how many of the signatories actually report on their commitments and how many of the signatories are on track to meet their commitments. So first of all, we make an assessment of the commitments that were made in 2013 and we find that only 30% of them were actually smart. The other 70% were just really too vague. And, you know, we don't accelerate uh, reductions in malnutrition through fuzzy commitments. We only accelerate them through smart and ambitious commitments. So we need to do better in 2016 in Rio. We need much more of those commitments to be smart. In terms of the uh, whether the commitments were met and whether they were reported on, um, whether or not they were smart, we find a troubling trend in 2015, which is that 21% of the commitments were not even reported on, despite uh, repeated requests from us to the signatories to tell us where they were. That's up from 10% in 2014, and that's a real failure of accountability on, on those uh, N4G signatory parts, and that number simply has to go down in 2016. The number of, uh, the percentage of commitments that were on track was roughly the same in 2014 as it was in 2014 at 44%. Now, the report monitors actions well beyond the Nutrition for Growth commitments, and here we focus on the 12 Lancet interventions, the essential nutrition interventions or the high impact nutrition interventions or sometimes they're called the nutrition specific interventions. There are 12 of them and here we note that it's actually really difficult to measure whether we're scaling up these interventions or not and don't forget that's a big ambition for the scaling up nutrition movement and for many other countries uh, outside of those 55 states in, in the sun. We all want to scale up effective nutrition interventions but at the moment, we can't actually figure out if we are, because for six of these interventions, there's no comparable national data. And in fact, only for three of them do comparable national data of the kind that we want actually exist. So we need to do better, much better, at measuring the coverage of nutrition-specific interventions in ways that are comparable across countries. But it's not just undernutrition interventions where we think there is an implementation failure or an implementation fog, if you like. Um, when it comes to interventions to create healthy food environments and healthy food systems, we know pretty much what to do. It's around the kinds of interventions around labeling of foods, marketing, prices, subsidies, taxes, um, the placement of uh, healthy foods in schools and hospitals and clinics the positioning of healthier foods in supermarkets and retailers, things around raising the productivity of pulses and fruits and vegetables. So we know what to do. Policymakers have lots of choices and lots of directions in which they can go. They just need to really get off their perches and fly away and make some, some sensible decisions and implement some of these policies and programs. So when we look at which countries are actually implement, implementing these kinds of programs, we find that of the 67 countries that the nourishing database uh, records policies from, only 10% um, only of them come from lower middle or low income countries, despite looking very hard for, those, for, those, for evidence of implementation of these policies in these lower middle and low income countries. So there's a, there's a big implementation failure, even though these countries uh, in the lower middle income and low income brackets have, as we've seen, increasing rates of obesity, very few of them are actually implementing policies and programs that we think will do good things for the ability of their food systems and food environments to be nutrition friendly. Next, I want to talk about finance. If we're going to scale up nutrition interventions and policies, we're going to need to support that with increased finance.
finance. And one of the key conclusions of the report is that every country will need to increase its spending on nutrition policies and programs. To figure out how much extra needs to be spent, we need to figure out what is allocated right now to nutrition. Last year, in the 2014 global report, we could only report on three countries that actually had gone through the exercise of figuring out how much they've allocated to nutrition. This year, we're pleased to be able to report that 30 countries are going through that process. These are the ones that stepped up. They're all Sun member countries, and uh, these are the ones below. Um, as of writing the report, uh, 14 countries had completed the exercise. What did they find? Uh, in terms of the domestic budget allocations to nutrition as a percentage of the total government budget, we found that the uh, average for these 14 countries was about 1.3%. Now, we don't actually have a benchmark for what an appropriate level would be, and, and to be fair, that would vary by country, uh, but it still seems like a very low percentage especially in relation to the upper bound, which was estimated by these 14 countries to be 4.1%. In other words, the potential to increase the actual allocations up to about 4% seemed to be there. Um, so the goal for these 14 countries is to get from 1.3% to 4.1%, and that requires making the argument, making the case for nutrition. Now, government spending is absolutely vital. For nutrition. Without government spending, um, no other funding will be crowded in unless it's an emergency situation. So governments set the tone and they need to increase their spending uh, quite dramatically on nutrition. But, but donors also play a very large role in supporting and leveraging. So what are donors doing? Well, the international donors have done pretty well in the last uh, 12 months and we really need to give them a lot of credit for what they've done. They've essentially doubled spending uh, disbursements on nutrition specific interventions the the Lancet 12 if you like from half a billion dollars in 2012 to nearly 1 billion dollars in 2013 which is fantastic we also have a fuller estimate of nutrition sensitive spending this is spending in agriculture education social protection water and sanitation that is um, relevant uh, judged relevant and important for nutrition by those donors, and that comes to four billion. So when you put the one billion and the four billion together, you get five, and divide that by 130 billion of overseas development assistance, and you get 4% of spending to nutrition, which is which is good, uh, but that could be higher. And why do we think it could be higher? Because 13 of the 29 OECD donors actually spend less than a million a year on nutrition-specific interventions. Um, and that includes some countries that are incredibly generous with overseas development assistance, such as Norway, Sweden, and Denmark. They need to step up and um, shoulder the burden and help increase that amount from 1 billion uh, to a much higher number. How much higher does that number need to go? Well, um, we don't have many estimates of what the nutrition gaps are. Here's probably the best one we have from R4D and the World Bank. They said, how much does spending on nutrition-specific interventions need to increase in the next 10 years for us to meet the World Health Assembly stunting target in, um, by 2025? And they said, uh, they estimate that governments need to, at a minimum, double their spending on these interventions, and donors need to quadruple, with uh, donors coming in at the front end of that 10-year period and governments are kicking in more at the back end of that 10-year period. So we're going to need more money for nutrition, and all of us need to make the case for more money for nutrition. However, um, in order to get more money for nutrition, we need more actors involved in, in the effort to turn back malnutrition. If you think about it, malnutrition is caused by a very powerful coming together of um, forces across across the board um, and to overcome malnutrition we need a very powerful alliance of forces to turn it back and there are three sort of groups of uh, actors and stakeholders that we feel are sort of underutilized by the nutrition community the climate uh, policy people the food system people and the business uh, sector so first climate we show that climate really affects nutrition quite a lot 
and, but also the nutrition choices can affect climate outcomes quite significantly. So first, how does climate affect nutrition? Well, there are lots of theories out there and lots of conceptual diagrams out there, but hard evidence is, is hard to come by. Here is the most compelling piece of evidence that we found. And this shows, uh, this is data from India, from the last national survey, last national uh, food, uh, last national family health survey in 2005-2006. This green line shows height for age, uh, standardized height for age scores for children under the age of three and how they vary by the month of the year. And you can see that kids born in May, June, July, August are considerably shorter for their age than kids born in January, February, November and December. Now this is because of seasonal fluctuations in temperature and rainfall and infection and food availability. But these differences are absolutely huge. Um, look at the, uh, the bracket on the left. This shows you that um, the median impact of a complementary feeding intervention is just 0 0.2 height for age Z scores. Well, look at that compared to the uh, variation in Z scores just purely by the month in which the child is born. In other words, a child born in April is going to be about minus zero minus it's going to be about 0 0.3 or 0 0.4 uh, height for age z scores below a child born in february that's much bigger than the impact of that complementary feeding program so being born in april or may wipes out the impact of your complementary feeding program compared to a kid born in february um, nutrition interventions need to do a much better job of season proofing and therefore climate proofing their interventions. Climate is just going to make these seasonal effects even more unpredictable and in some cases more extreme. At the moment it's a lottery for a child as to which month it's born in in terms of its early nutrition status. We need to end that game and make nutrition interventions much more climate proof. But diet choices and nutrition choices can also affect um, climate change mitigation. Here's some data from Tillman and Clark in a paper published in Nature last year, end of last year, that brings together hundreds and hundreds of um, diet surveys and shows that different diets have different consequences for greenhouse gas emissions. Here the axis is uh, kilograms of CO2 and carbon equivalents per person per year. And you can see that Mediterranean, Mediterranean pescatarian and vegetarian diets have very different carbon emissions. Uh, than the global average diet. So again, nutrition choices and diet choices can mitigate climate change to different degrees. So there seems to be a common agenda between nutrition and climate, and we would like to see uh, that common agenda be talked about and, and delivered on in the future. And we make a number of suggestions on how to do that. Um, we also talk a lot about food systems. Food systems, when you think about it, uh, 800 million people in the world don't have enough food to eat. Uh, 2 billion people in the world are uh, micronutrient malnourished. They don't have an adequate quality of diet. And 1.9 billion people are uh, overweight. Uh, those, those groups all overlap. We don't know to what extent they overlap, but I think it's fair to say that one in three people in the world is not well served by their food system uh, currently. And we know that poor diet is now the number one risk factor in the global burden of disease. A paper just came out in The Lancet in September of this year that shows this very clearly. So despite the fact that food systems affect everyone and that poor diet is the number one risk factor in the global burden of disease, do we know how our food system, do you know how your food system is doing in terms of promoting nutrition and health? In other words, how, how nutrition friendly is your food system? This was the challenge we put to the chapter authors of this chapter in the Global Nutrition Report. We said, come up with a dashboard that will help policymakers figure out how nutrition friendly their food system is. And they came up with 13 indicators in four buckets, food affordability, consumption diversity, health and nutrition status outcomes, and environmental sustainability. Now, is this dashboard the be-all and end-all for all food policymakers for all countries? No, of course not. Is it a useful starting point for policymakers in a particular country to start thinking about their food system and how nutrition friendly it is? We think so. We spend quite a bit of time talking about businesses in the report, and that's because businesses, you know, 
nutrition is is derived from food, health, water, sanitation, information, choices. And most of those choices and products and services are supplied by markets. So business is already heavily involved in shaping nutrition outcomes. The question is, um, how can we minimize the negative consequences of business operation for nutrition and how can we maximize the positive? At the moment, the nutrition community seems very split. There's a group that says nutrition is, uh, the business is you know, the, the solution to everything when it comes to nutrition. And there's a group that says uh, business should just be kept out of nutrition completely. It's, it's, it's evil. And I think there's a big silent majority in the middle that says, well, I'm sure it's useful for some things, um, but not, and not for others, for some groups and not for others, for some products and services, but not for others. But what we need is some kind of roadmap or series of signposts to help take us through the minefield that is the nutrition and business space. Now, to move forward, we quickly found from talking to people and reading around the topic that we get stuck in this, um, this, this stalemate of some people saying, well, I'm not going to engage with businesses until they can show me that they're trustworthy. Another group of people saying, well, the only way to build trust is to engage. And so we, get, we seem to be stuck in this chicken and egg situation. Which comes first, trust or engagement? We spend a lot of time in the report talking about how we can promote transparency and monitoring because we feel that that builds trust and trust is the essential ingredient to seize and identify opportunities to advance nutrition. So we talk about registering of public-private partnerships. We talk about a nutrition transparency initiative that's very similar to the extractive industries transparency initiative that helps uh, citizens determine where the resources are flowing from um, extractive industry taxes. We talk about an enforcement litigation fund that helps governments actually um, enforce the legislation that's on the books already uh, against challenges from the private sector. We talk about um, disclosures uh, that, com that companies can make in response to initiatives like the Access to Nutrition Index, which asks for asks 25 large food and beverage companies to tell the world about their um, conduct uh, performance and structure when it comes to nutrition relevant actions and um, we also call for a public research initiative a publicly funded research initiative on when the private sector does and does not add value to nutrition interventions there isn't such a program at the moment and it's desperately desperately needed the one specific uh, several specific recommendations we make the the main one really the overarching one is that we want the four main UN agencies responsible for nutrition to work with others to establish an inclusive time-bound commission, inclusive time-bound commission, to develop a shared understanding of the roles and responsibilities of business in nutrition. Until that happens, we feel like it's just too easy for the two extremes of the uh, debate to, to dominate and for that silent majority to not really have a voice or to have a, um, any guidance as to how to interact and how to engage with the, with the business sector. Finally, we come on to accountability and data, and this is the bread and butter after all of the report. It's an accountability report, and it's a report that's based on data and evidence. Um, in addition to the report, we also produce 193 of these two-page summaries, one for every country, and every one of these summaries, this is one for South Africa, every one of these has over 80 indicators on it. And these 80 indicators tell us about nutrition outcomes, underlying determinants, nutrition programs, policies, legislation, spending, um, processes, institutions, you name it. Each country has one of these. Um, however, every one of these um, nutrition country profiles has plenty of this grey space on it. And that means there's missing data. How much missing data is there? Well, again, we've made some progress in the last year. In 2014, only 99 countries actually had enough data to allow us to track four of their World Health Assembly targets for under, under nutrition. Well, this number has increased in 2015 to 108, so that's fantastic. Uh, however, we don't want to get too carried away because there's still 58 countries for which we can only track 
um, progress on one of the World Health Assembly targets. We need to get much more green and much less red on that picture. Finally, our calls to action. We try to make very specific calls that are smart, uh, measurable, assignable, realistic and time bound. There are about 40 of them in total under nine or ten headings. And these are the headings. Uh, elevate nutrition across the SDGs. We still have time to get some more nutrition indicators into the SDG indicator set. If any of you have any influence or can, can influence this process in any way, uh, please do. The report tells you who to contact and how to do it. So um, if we don't get more indicators in, uh, we've only got ourselves to blame. Strengthen national accountability on nutrition. This essentially means um, countries make smart targets for your outcomes on stunting and wasting and overweight and breastfeeding. Um, it's all very well having global targets that are applied to national level, but they're not owned by countries. You need to find your own targets that can be owned by you, that are sufficiently ambitious and specific, and that your citizens can hold you accountable for. Three, we need to strengthen the Nutrition for Growth commitments. They need The commitments in 2016 in Rio need to be much smarter than the ones in London in 2013. Um, if you sign up for a commitment, you have to report on it. And if you report on it, we want to see progress that you're um, on track to meet it. Um, we also need some implementation, some more implementation on addressing malnutrition. On the undernutrition interventions, we actually don't know how well we're doing on implementation because we don't collect enough information on coverage. On food system and food environment interventions, we think that there's a massive implementation gap, especially in the low and middle-income countries. Even though obesity is rising in those countries, there are no policies being implemented to halt it or slow it down. We need to find more funding for nutrition. Um, we have a better handle now on how much money is being spent. We're trying hard to make sure that the money is spent has a as big an impact as possible. But to meet those World Health Assembly targets and the Sustainable Development Goal targets, every country is going to have to find more funding for nutrition. Um, we're going to have to find more power and more alliances for nutrition. Um, malnutrition is generated by powerful forces working across society and the economy, and we need equally powerful forces to combat and counter that, um, that malnutrition surge. So we need to build alliances between nutrition and climate. We need food systems to be nutrition friendly, so we need to figure out whether they are and what we can do to make them more friendly. And we need to build a greater shared understanding of the roles and responsibilities of business in nutrition. If we don't, um, we may be letting business off the hook in terms of generating negative outcomes for nutrition. And we may be missing some very key opportunities in advancing nutrition uh, in partnership with businesses under certain circumstances in certain contexts. Finally, we need to identify the data gaps that hinder action. Without data, we're flying blind. We can't be guided to do the right things. We may end up doing the wrong things. But we don't want to fill every data gap. We just want to fill data gaps that we think are hindering effective and impactful action. And we need to fill those. And finally, I just want to end on this slide, um, which is a, it was a, a picture in, a, in an article from The Economist on designer babies. This is the idea that you can, in the future, we will be able to uh, alter DNA to, to generate attributes that, that people think are desirable attributes for babies and, and, and humans to have. And I was looking at the attributes in the picture and I was thinking to myself, well, high IQ, um, being a sprinter means good body length, good muscle mass, 20-20 um, vision, good eyesight, the prevention of strokes and other non-communicable disease. All of these are are the result of investing in good nutrition in the first thousand days after conception. All of them. Um, so if you want designer babies, forget about messing around with DNA. Just invest in nutrition. Thank you very much.